Thank you. Well, we are so grateful to be here and um, so excited to, because we know that this message has a creative power to transform lives and, and to participate in that transformation is just such an honor. So, um, wow, let's just thank, thank Abba. Jesus, thank you for being present. Thank you for interpreting the scriptures for us. Thank you for interpreting the meaning of our lives for us. To, to find the value and to find the meaning that you see in it. Thank you, Spirit of Truth, for guiding us into all truth, to shine a light and open up this mystery, which is God, and to surprise us. <laughs> to surprise us with who and what you are and who and what we are. Thank you, Abba. Why don't each one of you just have a chat to Abba right now and say, Lord, I'm opening up my heart and my mind for you to transform me. <laughs> Thank you, Papa. I, um, I don't often remember exactly the message that I spoke at the place the previous time I was there because we go constantly but somehow, about three or four weeks ago, I remembered um, the message encountering the resurrected Jesus. And I was suddenly just so stirred to continue on that same theme because it's a theme that we can hardly ever exhaust. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview, hopefully in less than a few minutes, of what we looked at last time, I think it was Luke 24, the road to Emmaus, and how two disciples um, was walking kind of confused because everything that they expected Jesus to be, the Messiah to be, came to a crashing, disappointing end. I mean, of all the Messiahs that we expected, a dead one wasn't the highest on the list. You know, of everything that we expected him to accomplish and do, the events of the previous few days left them confused, left them sad. And, and so as they walked and started discussing these things with one another, suddenly another person started walking with them. And so in this conversation, Jesus begins to reveal himself and unveil himself to them. <laughs> Sorry, my brother. Could you switch that off? Thank you. Jesus comes and he walks with them in this conversation and starts unveiling to them a new way of understanding the events of the past few days. Now, you can't have a more literal interpretation of those events than what they actually were there. They saw it. They saw the whole passion, the Jesus dying, all of these happenings. It was literal. It was yet there's something deeper about these events, a meaning which they completely missed. And the way in which they interpret these events left them sad. And, and you know, the Luke is such a master interpreter. That word that they were walking looking sad is a very rare word, and we actually find it in in very few other places, and one of the places that we find it in the Old Testament, the Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament. And there's one other place, you remember the, the baker and the butler that was thrown into prison with Joseph? And one morning, Joseph looks at them and he says, why are you looking so sad? And he uses the same Greek word, that Luke uses in Luke 24. 
And they say, well, we've had these dreams, but we do not know how to interpret them. And can you see that Jesus is speaking to these disciples and he's saying, you've interpreted my death in a way that's leading, leaving you confused and sad. And I'm going to start opening up a meaning around that which is going to completely change your understanding of it. Now, um, many of us, uh, it, it's quite difficult to change our understanding and our interpretation of things, isn't it? Have you ever noticed how right you are? Uh, and so, in the context of finding our security in how right we are, we expect that revelation and God revealing himself is going to be this event in which he's going to come and pat us on the shoulder and say, you've always been right and I'm just going to come to reveal the depth of how right you've been. <laughs> but that is not true revelation. <laughs> Sometimes the most awesome, life-shattering, beautiful revelation is when God comes and he just shatters the very foundation of your certainties and your beliefs and, and it all crumbles and all your concepts of God starts to crumble. <laughs> that is very often the surest sign that God is busy revealing himself to you is that your concepts of God are starting to crumble. That is God saying, hey, you've outgrown your small ideas about who I am. <laughs> Woo! You've outgrown those little concepts and, and I'm drawing you into possibilities that you haven't even imagined before. You see, when God becomes boringly predictable in your life, you, when you become boringly predictable to yourself, you can be sure that you are not really dealing with God anymore. You are dealing with your concepts of God. You're busy fellowshipping with your ideas, <laughs> being intimate with your concepts. But God himself remains surprisingly, excitingly, beyond all you've imagined. And he wants to continue to surprise you. <laughs> so I want to look this morning at three things that Jesus reinterprets, three concepts that he totally subverts. Um, so he's on the road to Emmaus with his two disciples, and he begins to show them in all the scriptures, some of the translation says, he begins to reinterpret the scriptures for them so that they might recognize him in it all. So, what does Jesus reinterpret? Now, one of the things that is obviously at the forefront of their minds is the fact that he just died. <laughs> And that leaves them confused because, you know, it's always the false messiahs that die. We've had a number of people claiming to be the messiah, claiming to be a prophet, and, and the Romans took care of them. And obviously, the fact that God did not save them must mean that they were just a false messiah. I mean, that's what one of the guys next to Jesus says. Um, you know, if you are the Messiah, why don't you just come off his cross and save yourself? Now, interestingly, when Jesus speaks about his own imminent death in Matthew 23, from verse 29 onwards, he doesn't speak about his own death as a unique occurrence, as a unique event. Obviously, in our theology, we look at the death of Jesus and there's something so tremendously unique about it. But let's look at what Jesus says about his own death. And when Jesus speaks about his own death in Matthew 23, he actually says, 
what's going to happen is nothing new. This has always happened. You've always killed your prophets. You've always killed those who started to speak truth to power, those who started to, to shake the established order, those who said things that kind of shattered your world. You've always <laughs> shut them up by killing them. And so in a sense, Jesus is saying this, there's going to be nothing new about the fact that you kill me. But Jesus is going to give us a radically new way of interpreting that event and interpreting that death. You see, violence has always been, in all the nations, it's been a way, it's been the one event in which we have invoked the name of God and justified our violence with God. <coughs> Um, and by justifying our violence, by, by saying God inspired to, or God justifies it, I mean, have you ever noticed that any violence done to you is evil? Have you ever noticed that any violence done by you to somebody else is justified? And this is the way in which nations and tribes throughout all ages have built their own identity. The violence done against us is undoubtedly satanic, it's evil. <laughs> and, and the violence we do to others is undoubtedly justified and God is on our side. I mean, this is the, the way in which humans have reasoned long even before Christianity came about, long before um, the Jewish uh, faith came around. This is the way in which nations across this world, civilizations have been formed on the sacrifice and the corpses of those who would disrupt the order of their community. And so all your origin myths always tells you a story of a time of great chaos and, and great violence that through a creative act of violence where we focus our frustration and detention on one scapegoat and kill him, that then brings a new unity within the community. But, but that act of violence is so disturbing that we often cannot accept that we've done it. And so we invent gods that justifies our violence. And it becomes sacred violence or sacrifice. It becomes violence that was justified by God to preserve our community. And this has been gone, going on forever. And so also one of the things that Jesus says in, Luke 20, uh, in Matthew 23 is that all the blood of all the victims from Abel until today, their message and everything they represent is going to be summarized for this generation in his death. You see, what did the blood of all innocent victims throughout all the ages, what has it called for? Justice. And what kind of justice? Vengeance. <laughs> we want our blood to be revenged. We want something to be done to set the record straight. From the blood of Abel, the, even just before Jesus showed up, the Maccabees, which was a Jewish um, group who fought to be set free from the political oppression, many of them, and there's the book of Maccabees, many of them were persecuted. Some of them were even crucified, just like Jesus is going to be crucified. 
But something very different happened in their crucifixion, in all the crucifixions before Jesus' crucifixion. What these guys, and there's one story, I think it's eight or nine brothers that were killed one after the other. And each one of them, as they were being murdered, cried out for justice, cried out for vengeance, cried out to those who killed them, you better enjoy this moment because our God's going to torture you forever. That was their message in their last breath. And so this has been happening all along, and we've justified our violence. But the cross comes to completely overturn our understanding of violence. You see, in the cross, God's, God comes to display that he is not the one who justifies our violence. He is the one who suffers it. Now, whether you are the one, whether you're the perpetrator of violence, or whether you are the victim of violence, we have always asked God, where are you in this situation? When people have suffered, whether it's the Holocaust or any other atrocity, the question in the forefront of our minds is, where is God? The cross is God's answer. I am the one who suffers your torment with you. I'm not the one who stands at a distance and punishes you and delights in your suffering. No, I am the one who suffers with you. Now, that is a radical new way of understanding violence, even in some of our theories of atonement and, and reconciliation. We've imagined that God somehow needed this kind of violence to again feel better about you. We've imagined God being so offended at our sin that the only thing that would satisfy his anger was blood. That's not a new idea. That's the idea that pagan religion had since the very beginning of human history. The gods are mad. Let's give them sacrifices and blood to appease their anger and then they will become more kind towards us. Jesus completely overturns that understanding on the cross, and he shows us that your violence cannot be justified with God. <laughs> your violence is your own. That's why when Peter starts preaching, uh, and there's so many examples of this, Acts 5 verse 30, when he speaks about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, he's very clear who is involved in what part. Who's involved in the violence? Acts 5 30. This Jesus whom you have murdered, God raised him up. <laughs> Can you see that even in our theology, we again excused ourselves from this event, in that it wasn't us who killed Jesus. This was God's idea all along. <laughs> but when Peter preaches, he says, no, the event of his horrible, violent death is your doing. Humans do the killing. God does the raising up. God does the making alive. And so he's starting to subvert our idea of violence. In fact, what causes Paul to convert and change his mind about who God is and who we are? Acts 9, he was breathing out murders and, and he's on his... Uh, donkey on his way to go and find some more Christians to arrest because they, their whole way of belief and faith is offensive to God because, I mean, he's got the scriptures. He knows what is true. He knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's right. 
And God justifies his actions in persecuting those who are wrong. <laughs> and suddenly a light knocks him off his animal. And, and he says, who are you? And Jesus says, <laughs> why do you persecute me? <laughs> See, Jesus takes violence personally. <laughs> he, say, he doesn't say, you know, why do you persecute those other people? Or why don't you care about people that are homeless or people that are in prison? No, Jesus says, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. And in this moment that Paul realizes that the God that he created in his conceptual theological boxes, this God who justified his violence, actually in reality does not exist. And it's at the point of his deepest doubt that faith has an opportunity to reach and take hold of a possibility of who God is. <laughs> and when he realizes that God was simply my excuse for justifying my violence, that is the point in which he is converted. You see, it doesn't matter what label your religion goes under. Whether it's Islam or Buddhism or Christianity, if your doctrine justifies violence, you need to be converted. <laughs> you need to meet Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who says, why are you persecuting me? And so the very apostle that brings this gospel to most of the world is the one who's been converted because his understanding of violence was completely turned upside down in an encounter with Jesus. So, Jesus reinterprets how we understand violence. Jesus reinterprets how we understand justice. See, but these two go hand in hand, often, violence and justice. Um, now, Peter, in Acts 2, begins to speak to the very people who were responsible for Jesus' death. And you know, we, we say Peter preached the gospel, the good news, but when he began, this is not good news. Because the reason we kill our victims is we want to shut them up forever. And suddenly, Peter starts saying, your victim is back. The one you killed, thinking that you're doing God a favor, God raised him from the dead. In other words, God was not the one behind your violence. God actually undoes your violence. God undoes your vengeance. And then in Acts 10, he even says, and God raised him up and made him Lord. Oh my goodness, we don't want our victim to be the judge. This is... The zombie apocalypse on a scale that we haven't seen before. The dead is back to judge you. And um, so they are cut to the heart. And again in, in Acts 2, he says, This Jesus whom you crucified. God was not the one who delighted in this violence, in this blood. You did the killing. Now, maybe it's hard for us to identify with these guys. Because obviously, if we were there, we wouldn't have joined in with the crowd. Isn't that true? I mean, obviously, if we were there, we would have been like some of the disciples who stood to, oh, 
some of them also, actually none of them, stood with Jesus <laughs> to the end. Yeah, so, so even the, the whole story of how Peter is the most uh, zealous to want to grab a sword, and, but they all disappear as the events turn further, and we're going to read a scripture in Acts 10, all of them, fear takes over, and they run. They, want, they don't want to be part of those who are isolated and scapegoated. And so we need to see that this is not just a historic story. This is a story that always happens, that communities find safety in people who are like us, people who are thinking like us, part of our club, who agree with us. But it's that very kind of community that often justifies, even subconsciously, violence against those who are not like us. Violence against those who are not part of our club, part of our community. And very often a church can become that very kind of community that excludes rather than includes. And we're going to look at the beautiful passage in John of God's idea of church <laughs> and community, which I think is so going to resonate with this community. But that's the next point. Let's go back to justice. So our idea of justice is let's get even. Let the blood of the innocent victims get vengeance. And Peter presents to them their victim, but he comes to them not with condemnation. He comes to them with forgiveness. See, never before do we have an account of a person being prosecuted and, and crucified and in the process of dying saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In other words, we are so deeply embedded in this cycle of, of vengeance, of victimizers and victims, that we do not even recognize our part in it. Now in Acts, um, in Acts 8, speaking about Paul, Paul was standing by consenting to the death of Stephen. He wasn't even actively involved in the violence. But him just standing by was a form of consent to say, let's just allow it to happen. Um, so how does Jesus transform justice? He transforms it by showing us that uh, true justice doesn't just give you what you deserve. The divine order of justice gives you what you need to be healed. And so Jesus doesn't just come back to get even with those who killed him. He comes back offering restoration. He comes back offering a way of being restored and healed. Now, we can understand that the victimizer, the one who does violence to others, we can understand that they need forgiveness. But why would the victim need forgiveness? Now, in our societies, there are many people who are victims of violence. And it doesn't just have to be physical violence. It's any form of manipulation that that twists you and forms you into something that you are not. And that exactly is why the victim also needs forgiveness, because the pain and the suffering has all often formed us or deformed us. And we resent the victimizer. We resent the one who has formed us by the very pain and suffering that we've experienced, we've become the mirror reflection of the violence that has violated us. And so the victim needs forgiveness as much as the victimizer. And to a very large extent, all of us 
have been both victims and victimizers. Um, now, something beautiful happens in Hebrews 12, 24. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 23, the blood of all innocent victims from Abel to, to now is going to be summarized and concluded in this generation. Then in Matthew 13, verse 35, he says, I'm going to unveil things that were hidden since the foundation of the world. See, there was something in this cycle of victims and victimizers that was never obvious, that was never clear, that we could never see. But in Hebrews 12, verse 24, we begin to see the unveiling. It speaks about the blood of Jesus, and it says his blood speaks of better things than the blood of Cain uh, of, uh, uh, and, and, and all the um, Abel, I think. Yeah. So his blood speaks of better things than the blood of all the uh, victims before. And so what did the blood of all the victims before say? We want vengeance. What does the blood of the one victim that we know beyond the doubt is innocent? What does his blood say? Forgiveness. You see, this is what gives the blood of Jesus its power. It's its message. It's not a magical incantation that we do to, to call forth his blood to do things in another realm. It's the message of this blood who despite being innocent and suffering our violence speaks forgiveness and healing and restoration. That's the power of this blood and the message of this blood. And now I want to go to the last little passage which is Beautiful. So Jesus transforms our um, understanding of violence, that God doesn't justify violence, he suffers our violence. Jesus transforms our understanding of justice, that justice is not getting even, justice is being restored and being given whatever you need to be healed, and both the victimizers and the victims needs this restoration. Jesus is reinterpreting events. He's reinterpreting the human story, and he's trying to bring us to a conclusion that we never came to. Since the beginning of time, these things were hidden. And Jesus says, I'm going to expose it. That God has always been the one who wanted to heal and restore. That the pain and the suffering in this world has never been his idea. That he's the one who brings healing to that. And then lastly, he transforms our whole concept of what it means to be a community. So you see, every tribe, every community has always built their identity on what they are against, on what they are not. Um, we, are this tri we are tribe A because we are not like tribe B. I am who I am because I'm not you. We've always built our identities on negation. And in our communities, very often it was sacred violence or sacrifice that united the community into greater union. When there's disorder in a, in a tribe and the, the violence increases, very soon they discovered that if we, we put in a mechanism so that all that frustration can be focused on one scapegoat, peace will resume in the community. And so religion began as a way in which we controlled violence. I know it's popular to think that religion causes violence, but it's more accurate to think of violence causes religion. 
humans were violent before there was religion. <laughs> okay. And religion became a way of let's, let's still allow violence, but let's minimize it. Instead of everyone killing everyone, we'll put in a ritual of sacrifice, a way in which we can limit the violence to one event every now and then. And, and over many generations, as God started revealing himself, he got us eventually out of the habit of sacrificing other humans and to, into a habit of sacrificing animals and other things instead. But that's not the end of the story. He's taking us on a journey to bring us to that place, as the prophet says, whoever told you that I needed sacrifices and offerings. <laughs> uh, and so Jesus becomes the final sacrifice, the one who completely overturns our concept of sacrifice. You see, the way in which we develop the concept of sacrifice is I'm willing to sacrifice you for my benefit. That's how sacrifice began. <laughs> I'm willing to sacrifice someone or something else to please the gods and benefit me. In, in the most violent form, communities would do human sacrifice to please an angry God, to preserve their unity. But in a very simple form even today we are very often willing to sacrifice situations and people and whatever for our own benefit jesus overturns that concept of sacrifice and says the only true sacrifice is when you willingly give yourself for the benefit of another that's true sacrifice that's the sacrifice we see in jesus um, and lastly, community. So all communities have been built on tombs. Luke 23 as well, you walk over these tombs and, and you make them pretty and decorated. And by that very act, you, you justify your forefathers who killed these prophets. So all communities was built on this process. But some, a new community is going to be birthed. And for the first time, a community is going to be birthed not on the grave of their victim, but on an empty tomb. For the first time, a community is going to be birthed that doesn't produce victims, but embrace victims. A community that's going to reach beyond their differences. <laughs> A community that's not going to find their identity in what they are not. But the community who's going to see the presence, the value, and the beauty of God in everything. That's why Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Now all things are of God. <laughs> and he's given us the message of reconciliation to say, God's got nothing against you. <laughs> he doesn't hold your trespasses against you, but invites you into this community. I've been trying to read this verse. I'm going to read it now. This is uh, John 20 from verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. So they, I mean, they started seeing they've killed Jesus we next. And so they're running. They all gather in a room. They lock the doors. That is very often the description of a community that has allowed fear to begin to divide them or, or to, to form them. We just want to preserve what we have. But Jesus came and stood amongst them and said to them, Peace. <laughs> when he had said this, he showed them his hands and, and his side. For me, that is so beautiful that the resurrected Jesus still has those wounds. 
Now, this is not some just metaphysical floating spirit. This is the same Jesus who was crucified. And those material wounds are still visible. But they are now the source of healing to others. You know, very often our wounds can become the reason we wound others. But the encounter with the resurrected Jesus transforms our wounds into a way in which we can heal those who need healing. And so he stood amongst them with all these wounds. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Uh And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And last night, somewhere during the night, I woke up with this scripture. And I feel this is really something precious for you. Um, It's a scripture that we've often misunderstood. He said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, there's a beautiful book by Sandra, let me see, Sandra Snyder's Jesus Risen in Our Midst, in which she does a thorough theological breakdown of that scripture. I'm not going to go through all the detail. But basically, that second part of the scripture that we've Translated, if you retain the sin of any, they will be retained. That word sin doesn't even occur in that text. It was part of the interpretation that was given to it by the, the, the translators. And so she translates it this way. Um, whoever you forgive is forgiven, and whoever you embrace will be held. (laughs) See, that second part doesn't say whichever sins you retain will be retained. It just says whoever you you hold will be held fast. It kind of corresponds, the same words are used when Jesus said, Father, whomever you have given me, I've held them and I've not let them go. And this is that beautiful message that Jesus brings to these people, who, these disciples who've allowed fear to, to stifle their, their vision. And they, they, they got into a mode of we, we just need to preserve our own life. And God says, no, <sighs> receive my spirit. <laughs> and this spirit is going to cause you to reach out beyond the boundaries of what you are comfortable with, beyond the boundaries of your culture, beyond the boundaries of those who agree with you, beyond all those boundaries, this spirit is going to give you the power to forgive and to embrace the outsiders and whoever you embrace will be held. (laughs) Jesus is so excited about your life because your life is his opportunity to live again. Wherever you are, (laughs) God has a unique location in you. He's got a unique personality in you. He's got the relationships that you have with other people. God doesn't have those relationships anywhere else but through you. (laughs) That's why he says, hey, you are my body. (laughs) You are the ones that's going to embrace You know, I I can so identify with what Nick says in my own journey, that there was a time where religion and this kind of uh, performance-based religion of I need to try 
through my own effort to persuade God to be kinder to me, how that was completely overturned when I met a God who gave himself unreservedly to me. <laughs> Even when I least deserved it. And that same experience now becomes the very heart of what we extend to those in our circle of relationship. That we begin in our encounters and friendships with other people, not with the question, what do you believe? And we often don't ask that, but very often that's the attitude. I want to make sure that you're on the same page as me. I want to make sure that you're the same faith as me. Jesus challenges us to begin with this very simple, basic engagement. You are loved. Even when you meet your enemy, you begin. <laughs> and this must be Jesus' most difficult saying. Love your enemies. Now the Beatitudes is in a way uh, a fulfillment of the law because, and I'm closing with this, because Jesus, uh, Jesus doesn't just come to keep the law. He comes to unveil the real heart of the law. So for instance, where, where the law says, uh, you shall not murder in the Beatitudes, he says, don't even be angry. So that's where murder begins. In other words, this is not just laws of prohibition of what you shouldn't do and should do. But this is about the transformation of your inner man. So that anger doesn't even have a place in you. Much less murder. Um, the, 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 another place, you know, for instance, the law said, you shall not steal. And Jesus has the audacity. Can you believe this? In Matthew 5, where he says, You've heard it said, and then he quotes the Bible, and he says, but I say to you, who do you think you are? <laughs> he is reinterpreting the scriptures in a profoundly consistent way with how they've been uh, interpreted, but he, he's giving us the deeper meaning. So you've heard it say. You know, you shall not steal. But I say to you, if somebody wants to steal your coat, give him your shirt also. So this is a transformation of the heart that it's not just I'm trying to prevent myself from stealing. This is such a transformation that I will not even resist the one who tries to steal from me. In fact, I'm going to overwhelm him and give him more than what he's trying to steal. That's a transformation, isn't it? Um, and so in all these things, Jesus is starting to reinterpret the way in which we understand God, the way in which we understand ourselves, the way in we, which we understand community, the way in which we understand justice, and he's bringing us back to that place of, I didn't just come and give you a nice teaching. I came to show you what it looks like when God becomes flesh in your body. Because the incarnation was never meant to be one historic event. That happened a few thousand years ago. The incarnation was always meant as the revelation of what God has always intended for every person. That in your flesh, in your body, God wants existence. God finds his freedom in your freedom. In fact, we often quote that verse that says the word became flesh and we immediately think of Jesus. But if you read the whole verse... John 1, 14, it says, and the word became flesh. That means we must see what stands before this word. And, and, and the verse before verse 14 says, you were born, not of the will of flesh or the will of man, but of God. 
and the thoughts of God became flesh. <laughs> and of his fullness have we all received. In fact, it first says, and tabernacled in us. Well, we said and dwelt in us, but it's that same word, tabernacle. Remember that mobile, skin-covered dwelling place in the Old Testament? What a beautiful picture. God always knew he wanted the mobile, skin-covered dwelling place. And so the, the thoughts of God became flesh, tabernacled in us. And of his fullness have we all received grace upon grace upon grace. This grace is not just a new message. This grace is what makes grass to grow. This grace is what gives you breath. This grace is the givenness of your existence. You didn't ask to be here. <laughs> your existence is just given to you, moment by moment by moment. In fact, Meister Eckhart said, if you could right now see what makes you truly you, you will see nothing less than the infinite generosity of God pouring himself out in your existence. What makes you you is the fact that God is giving himself in your existence to this world. You see, in Jesus, we do not meet a God who says, come on, guys, you need to become a little bit more spiritual. You need to rise up to a higher level of spirituality. No, in Jesus, we meet a God who descends into our humanity. <laughs> not the God who, who says, you need to try and be more like God. But the God who says, I want to become more part of you. I want to intertwine myself in your flesh, in your existence. The incarnation continues. <laughs> you are God's opportunity to embrace, to love, to heal, to restore <laughs> you are God's influence in this world. Do you want to get ready with the guitar while I think of the last, uh, share the last few thoughts? Does that resonate? It does. <laughs> mm. Papa. Papa, we thank you for your continual faith in us, for the continual way in which you give yourself in our existence. Thank you for completely subverting our ideas of who you are and, and who we are. Thank you for bringing us into a consciousness of union an awareness that it is in our lives, in our stories, in our relationships, that you find the opportunity to bring healing and restoration to everything around us. Thank you, Papa, for your presence within this community, your presence that inspires them to go <laughs> and live and love and include. Thank you, Papa. Mm. Amen.